Hello, all you beautiful beings. Is it possible to do a call out of someone whose work you generally like? I don't know, but I'm doing it. I've been watching the Mysterious Mr. Mr. Enter's videos for several years now, and while I don't always agree with his points of view, I can usually see where he's coming from. Recently, though, he put out the most 2018 thing possible. A video being whiny and offended over everyone else supposedly being whiny and offended. Because I hope this is a trope we can leave behind in 2019, let me go through it piece by piece. So, it's been a rather crazy December so far, hasn't it? With that YouTube rewind thing. Fortnite. Tumblr committing seppuku, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer being offensive, along with everything else nowadays, like peanuts and a poo. Let's just say that there's some topics that I want to cover. <sighs> Buckle in, kids. I'd say that the world has gone crazy, but it's been crazy for quite some time now. So recently, I believe it was the Huffington Post that said Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the ranking best film, was offensive because Rudolph's disability only became acceptable when he provided a benefit to his society. And also VeggieTales is racist. Okay, here's the thing. No one is actually doing anything outside of pointing out that in the Rankin Bass Rudolph special, everyone is pretty much a jerk to him, including his parents. And he's basically expected to forgive them and help them out, despite the, them giving the most minor atonement possible. That's something you've pointed out as bad in movies like Chicken Little or shows like Family Guy, yet I guess this is different because... Nostalgia? But by the way, the Huffington Post video isn't 100% serious and no one is saying Rudolph should never be aired again, so kind of get over yourself. As far as VeggieTales, I did a little bit of Googling and the most I could find was this story about a cl class project by students at CSU San Marcos talking about how villains in VeggieTales are often given ethnic sounding ac accents as opposed to the white sounding heroes. Now, John, I don't know how much you know about the concept of coding, but, of course, my first BA was in English Lit, so I can give you some background. Coding is used as a device to signify meaning in literature and other media. You might know there's been a lot of talk in recent years about villains being queer-coded. Racial coding exists, too, usually in the form of dog whistle politics, or racializing non-human characters with stereotyped features and accents. And that raises the question of... Why give the villains these accents? It's worth thinking about. This is finally starting to annoy people, and I'm not entirely sure why. This has been going on for a decade at this point. People have been pointing out that everything is sexist, racist, ableist, homophobic, transphobic, and every other phobic -ist that you can imagine. I think that the top of the ridiculousness list for me is that milk is racist and air conditioning is sexist, and a bunch of other things that are clearly only true in La La Land. So <laughs> you serious? And thus we return to the wild world of dog whistle politics. Oh. <clears throat> gonna quote this article from theconversation.com. For members of the alt-right, dairy milk symbolizes the strength of body and society. Drinking it reinforces the notions of white superiority and idealized visions of masculinity. Soy milk represents weakness, emasculation, and all things politically correct. The hashtags, hashtag milk twitter and hashtag soy boy, celebrate traditional gender norms and the good old days of white-dominated patriarchy while ridiculing diversity and feminism. And a little further down, there's a long history of association between dairy milk and white supremacy, as legal scholar Andrea Freeman explores. Freeman traces a, the link back a century, with official U.S. government documents from the 1920s suggesting a link between white people, milk drinking, and a superior intellect. Similarly, sociologist M Melanie du Dupuy, Dupuy, I think that's how it's pronounced, has described how milk was central to the construction of the modern Western nation-state. The nutritionally perfect white drink was symbolically linked to the white-skinned bodies that were better, better able to digest it due to a genetic mutation known as lactase persistence. So uh, that's worth thinking about. Also, I'll include some links below to um, the air conditioning issue, as it were.
Seriously, if you don't believe me, just Google this. You're going to find something. It's actually a, a kind of random game you can play. Take a random word, maybe from a word generator, go to Google, and just type in that word is racist. You're going to find a publication from some uh, big news source, I'm sure. Like I said, though, this has been going on for years and years. Maybe I'm one of the few that's just really noticed it, uh, but the more people noticing it now, the better, I suppose. You know, if I were a more cynical person, I'd say you were trying, albeit too late, to pander to a large section of YouTube just to get in the good graces of people who otherwise wouldn't pay you much mind. If I were more cynical. Maybe it's just getting crazier as of late. I've kind of lost any sense of relativity. That's not to say that some media doesn't have these problems, especially in older works when our standards of what was PC were largely different. There is plenty of things in the past that were sexist, racist, and other things. Even things that are well-beloved. But I think that people are starting to wake up to the fact that this ban everything that goes against my sensibilities is getting a little bit too out of hand, as is the trigger happiness of considering everything prejudiced. I would think a critic, of all people, would understand that critiquing something is not the same as saying it should be banned. You know, this kind of thinking is why critics get bad reputations from, well, idiots. And again, no one wants Rudolph or VeggieTales banned. No one wants Apu off The Simpsons. Again, you're making mountains out of molehills. On some level, I'm not gonna lie. I find a little bit of humor in the situation. I mean, people are degrading culture, demanding things akin to book burnings and all that, but from a distance, it's all quite the farce. For starters, saying that something is sexist, racist, or whatever, when it's not, or it's lost the power to be, I can make the argument that not only doing that is sexist or racist, <laughs> you all know how much I love when white men try to decide what is and isn't sexist and racist. It's my favorite kind of gaslighting. It in no way makes me want to see them get wailed on by the women soldiers from Black Panther. No, not at all. But it's important for the proliferation of sexism or racism. Let me give you an example. The word gypped. This word means to rip someone off. When I was a kid, that's all that it meant. But today, people remember its connotation to the word gypsy, which is where the word comes from. In its inception, the word was definitely meant to hurt people, to say, these people do this particular harmful thing, which helped to propagate harmful stereotypes. However, nowadays, most people who use the word gypped don't know about the history, or even if they do like me, they just don't care. In essence, the word has been detached from its original meaning. It has lost its power to do harm. So what happens when somebody wants to educate people and remind them of the word's meaning. Well, they want to put a certain power back into that word, one that it does not have any longer. What you're actually saying when you say, you shouldn't use the word gypped because it used to be offensive is, I want this word to be able to hurt these kind of people again. Okay, stop. This kind of argument really pisses me off. <clears throat> Romani people can speak for themselves. You, to my knowledge, are not a Romani person, so you have no business speaking over them any more than you have telling me that the n-word is just a word. Just like you have no business telling people of Indian descent that they can't feel negatively about characters like Apu, or telling bisexual people well, that we shouldn't complain about characters like Buffalo Bill or and Maureen Johnson because at least it's something, but it's not good enough. You just, just don't go there. I want this word to have that kind of power. You might not have intended it that way, but there's no way around it. That's what you are saying. By saying that VeggieTales is racist when it's not, they're vegetables for Christ's sake. You're yes, they're vegetables. And the crows in Dumbo are birds, and this is a cat. The people who animate and voice cast these works aren't stupid, they know what they're doing. They might not even see anything wrong with it, but remember, racism doesn't require intent. You're saying that I want this thing to have the power to hurt black people. Unless, of course, you believe that racist language or media doesn't have the power to do harm to black people. If that's the case, then what's the point of pointing it out? So, saying that VeggieTales is racist, or anything else that obviously isn't racist is racist, you're being racist. Also- Ah, <sighs> yes. The old, you're racist for pointing out racism shtick. That never gets old. Oh, it's, it's still total nonsense, of course, but <laughs> never gets old. 
So the people who do tend to go looking for racism and sexism and everything, they actually tend to be prejudiced themselves in a lot of other ways too. For example, some people have claimed that meritocracy is sexist towards women. Meritocracy is the system where the best of the job rises to the top. By saying that meritocracy is sexist towards women, you are saying that men are better than women. Let's talk about- Oh my word. You legitimately don't understand the arguments against meritocracy, or you're just an intellectually dishonest hack. Hell, a few years ago you'd fit right in with the anti-social progress circle jerk on YouTube. Well, listen, the myth of meritocracy has already been discussed in tomes previously, so I'll just provide some links below. What about the word retarded? Nowadays, it's not PC at all to use. But do you know at one point it was considered the PC alternative? And of course, when that word wasn't in common use, the offense of that word got packaged into other words like spaz or spurg or autist. Here's the thing, removing an expression of prejudice doesn't remove the prejudice. By removing a word and not the values or feelings behind it, all people are going to do is jump onto another word and turn that into the next slur. You can notice this happening with changing PC terms from black to people of color or from illegal alien to undocumented migrant. Changing the word or even a word frequent in use isn't going to change people's feelings towards them. People are- Well, gee. Almost as if that's not the point of changing the words. Almost as if we need to look deeper to undo the prejudices within our world. And almost as if complaining whenever they're brought up isn't the way to do that. Imagine that. We're still going to be prejudiced towards people of color. So it just becomes an endless game of hopscotch. Go from one word to another as the previous word becomes appropriated by people who do have prejudice. I guess that brings us to cultural appropriation then. This should be riveting. Another invention of PC culture. I'd say that I don't get it, but I do in a sense. Cultural appropriation is when a dominant culture atops the mannerisms of a minority culture. You actually indulge in cultural appropriation whenever you order Chinese food. American Chinese food isn't anything like what you'd find in China. In fact, fortune cookies are actually Japanese, and the only place you couldn't get fortune cookies is in China. So maybe you should just stop going to Chinese restaurants and put all those Chinese Americans out of business. Then again, there are more Chinese people in the world than there are Americans. And from what I understand, they're doing pretty well economically. So in the grand scale of the globe, eating Chinese food wouldn't be cultural appropriation because it's a minority uh, adopting the expressions of a majority. Unless, of course, you think that American culture is the dominant culture in the entire world, which is racist, I believe. What do you do about things that are invented in more than one place in the world? Like, the video game genre of RPGs, or dreadlocks. Oh yeah, you assault people. I forgot about that. Alright, what do you do about things like spaghetti? Spaghetti, believe it or not, is actually the Achilles heel of cultural appropriation. Spaghetti and meatballs was specifically invented by Italian Americans to the point where you can't really get it in Italy. It's not an Italian food, it is an Italian American food. Because Italian- Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Okay, because this spiel goes on rather long, I'm going to provide a few links below, including one to Lindsay Ellis's video about Pocahontas, wherein she includes a bit about how cultural appropriation is actually a neutral term. Basically, that's the position I take. There is a world of difference between me, say, burning incense and having a dog named after a Norse god, or say, Disney trying to trademark a Swahili phrase. Seriously, Disney, you already own the world. Can you please not? The logic of PC culture has been used on this slice of things for the longest time. For years and years, I was told that Miss Pac-Man was sexist. Why? Because it replaced a male character with a female character. You know, along with doing a bunch of other things that we're just going to ignore for a point. But I really, really have to see Ghostbusters 2016, because it replaces male characters with female characters. It's the most progressive thing you could do. From a distance, this is comedy gold. But as I've said before, the best comedies in the world are absolute misery for the people living within them. Ironically, to me, that probably was the most annoying thing about the whole Ghostbusters fiasco. Your tears about the Ghostbusters movie don't really mean anything to me, knowing how much harassment Leslie Jones endured for her horrible crime of... being in the damn thing. Also, I'm pretty sure no one ever said you had to see it or you were an evil sexist. Hell, I didn't see it. As usual, reactionary said I was having a tantrum about... Nothing made it a million times bigger a deal than it would have been otherwise, and you fell for it hook, line, and sinker. Congratulations, you gullible, gullible rube. You see, these random things that people declare are racist, sexist, or whatever, can just randomly be declared not, even if they were progressive at one point. 
The only thing sexist about this whole thing was probably making the female Ghostbusters the bad one. Then again, Miss Pac-Man was better than the original Pac-Man, uh, and I don't know if that's still considered sexist. So I, I guess making the female one, the female version of a product better is more sexist apparently. Kevin Hart lost his job hosting the Oscars because of some homophobic tweets he made years ago that he already apologized for. If you want apologies to not work at all in the future, a good way to do that is to make them not count. So tell- Again, I don't really care about Kevin Hart and his losing his hosting gig at the Oscars and his half-assed apology. What he joked about is actually happening. Little boys who come out to their parents in recent years have literally been killed or killed themselves because of bullying and abuse. Go fuck yourself. Tell me, why should anyone ever apologize for any shitty thing that they've ever done if it's just not going to count? Especially because people who refuse to apologize at all seem to be doing quite well. A lot of the time, people clamoring for PC culture tend to be their own worst enemy. Because a lot of this stuff is very contradictory. It's a game you can't win. Let me hit you with an example. People want more stories about gay people. Okay, that's fine. Here's the story that I want to write. A gay person is accidentally outed by one of his loved ones. Just right off the cuff, any writer who tries to do this immediately falls into what I call the is ought problem. Do you write the situation as what would really happen, or what should happen? Alright, let's say you write the situation where everyone is completely accepting about this. You chose the ought, as this is the way that things ought to be. Well, you just disrespected gay people who went through a lot of hardship and trauma who were outed accidentally. Okay, so you decide to go the other way, make people react not pleasantly. You go to what you assume the is version is. Well, what happens now is you've written something that's triggering. You could avoid situations like this that are exclusive to gay people and are a part of gay people's story, but then you've gotten a token character. Which Question, um, why does your story about a gay person has to have to involve his coming out or being outed at all. Seriously, do you think that's the only story you can tell about a gay or bi character? Why not tell a story about a teenage boy who has a crush on the prettiest girl in school, but after she moves away, he realizes he has feelings for his male best friend, who returns those feelings and they start dating. Or an older man who's a college professor and has a loving husband of 15 years who happens to coach a softball team at the local high school. There's more than one story to tell. And this is where in the problem with this argument lies. You don't need to write a minority character based around the hardships related to their identity. The craft is one of my guilty pleasures, and it, but it fell into this. Characters of color can have stories that don't revolve around racism. Gay characters can have stories outside of homophobia. Trans characters can be characters even in a transphobic world. It's possible. It's doable. You can do it. Which is offensive. Like I said, it's a game that you can't win, and the only way to play a game you can't win is to not play. Because of PC culture, every female character creator makes will have all eyes on them. Every single little thing they do will be under the microscope now. Every part of their appearance will be criticized, even by the people who claim they hate body shaming. Every action that these characters do is wrong. They fall into any female stereotypes, they're setting the woman's movement back. But they fall into none of them, and they're just a man written as a woman. This is what PC culture does. If you're demanding... You, of all people, should understand that, a, that character critiques are part of criticism. Yes, bad criticism exists. Part of being a creator is being able to handle all of that with a grain of salt and maybe, heaven forbid, some humility. I've created characters in the past that have been garbage and I've had to go back and change them. It's part of the creative process. What a concept, right? the perfect story for any particular minority and nothing less, then people are going to stop trying to write these stories before you get to good. The truth of the matter is that there is no quintessential female character, no quintessential gay character, no quintessential trans character, because there is no quintessential female, gay person, or trans person. Here's the thing, if you're expecting to go to the theater and see yourself 100% the characters, you'll be disappointed 100% of the time. And Again, asking for a presentation that isn't stereotypical or heart-wrenching tragedy isn't demanding our exact stories be told. And you don't get to stand in a soapbox and lecture everyone that we need to accept whatever crumbs we get with a smile and a nod. Men, straights, cis people, neurotypical, they're all included in that. Your specific story is your specific story, and you're never going to see it told back to you exactly unless you write an autobiography. Even worse, this lie. It's become a marketing tool. Do you know there was a time when people didn't groan when a movie starred a female protagonist? This is because at one point, putting in a female character wasn't a result of this tap dance. Here's the rub. The only reason that movies like Ocean's 8 or Ghostbusters 2016, video games like Battlefield 5, or shows like High Guardian Spice seem to do this anymore is to try to win social brownie points. However, that's not something you can win for a variety of reasons. When you say, I'm telling THE trans story or THE gay story, you will fail because there is no one trans or gay story. And marketing your story as such 
is going to lead you to disaster. You keep demonstrating your simple-minded view of reality. It's one thing to not understand why people get upset about not being represented or why they, they get happy when they see themselves represented, but please stop pretending that you do get it, because you clearly do not. I do want to talk specifically about Battlefield V, though, as this is the point where PC culture has gotten from annoying to disgusting. It's probably a dead horse at this point, but Battlefield V was sold, or not sold, on PC culture, a female-first marketing campaign about a World War II game from a series that largely takes place in reality. Yes, women did fight in World War II, but not in the scenarios that they made and not in the way that they wrote it. Yes, please, crow on about how unrealistic this video game is. Should be riveting. There were actually some interesting scenarios that they could have picked, but no, they resorted to making shit up for the sake of girl power. The worst thing the PC culture is doing is historical revisionism. When am I supposed to tell my daughter when she can play someone who looks like her in Fortnite, but not in Battlefield V? Well, let's start with one thing that the developer of this game doesn't seem to realize. The Battlefield series is a series of M-rated games, and your kid probably shouldn't be playing M-rated games in the first place. Uh, but beyond that, you could tell her that that's not what really happened in World War II. That's great and all, but last I checked, people didn't typically learn history from playing video games. I don't recall Oregon Trail teaching me a lot about Western expansion. Uh, except that a lot of people died of dysentery. Uh, for the most part, uh, if we're becoming afraid to tell history because it's not politically correct, uh, we're going to be in very big trouble in the future. I mean, it wasn't that women didn't have a very important role to play in World War II. They kept the home front going while men were all at war. But I get it, you want to downplay the hardship that the women faced at the time. You want to hide the fact that they were discriminated against and couldn't enlist on the Allied forces. It kind of downplays all the struggles that women had to go through to actually eventually be able to enlist. But you do you. As fascinating as all of this is, I'd like to divert for a second to talk about Mulan. Don't worry, this is definitely going somewhere. I'm sure you're all familiar with the 1998 animated Disney film, but in case you're not, I'll briefly summarize. Mulan opens up with, with the Han army invading China during the Han Dynasty, leading to a draft for every able-bodied male in a Chinese household to go to war. The father of teenage Mulan is an aging veteran who agrees to go, but is too old and sick to survive. Mulan, despite the fact that she faces death for treason if caught, disguises herself as a boy and runs away to enlist in the army. Despite some setbacks, she's successful, and, ev and even seems to defeat the Huns in battle in, in the mountains, but after an injury, she's revealed as a woman and is almost executed. Yeah, seriously, go see the movie if you haven't, it's awesome. Now, I bring this up not because Mulan is based on a true story, it's actually based on a Chinese poem that's based on- that's become legendary, it's largely considered to be fictional now, but there is some debate about it. In any event, according to the legend, Mulan's true identity wasn't actually discovered by her comrades until years later when they come to visit her at home after she's already, um, out. So why do I bring this up? Well, Disney added things to the Mulan story that weren't needed in, that weren't the original poem. She wasn't tried for treason or nearly executed, so why add that? Why did it change so much? To add stakes. For there to be more of a conflict, for there to be more on the line if the hero gets caught. Also, it's hard to make a coming-of-age story that happens over the course of 12 years. A video game that's literally about war doesn't need more stakes. Yeah, Mulan had a war too, but that's not the focus. So, yeah, enter, that's worth thinking about. Gotta appeal to PC culture, even if it means doing things that PC culture is supposed to stand against. Honestly, that's probably the, the funniest thing about all of this. If they keep trying to revise history like this, they're going to start erasing their own points and basically become what they're fighting against. Did you know that Apple has been removing games that are meticulous in their historical accuracy to the point where they can be used as learning tools? Uh, but they've been removing them because the enemies were the Taliban and that's not PC. This is because Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, believes that hosting this kind of stuff is a sin. His literal words. A Digital book burning to prevent sin. Where have I heard about this one before? This is why I call these people Puritans, by the way. It's the perfect word for them, and it drives them crazy. In that case, please don't ever complain about your haters again. Maybe they just like driving you crazy. 
If you leave with anything, let it be this. Please leave all your please leave all your whinging about PC culture in 2018. Join us join us in 2019 in, in, without your first world problems. Please and thank you. And as always, peace, love, and stay hydrated.